Our brain is very well protected inside our skull with bone, membrane, and fluid, but we still find ways to injure it. This time on call, dealing with the sometimes terrible effects of brain trauma. The doctors are on call tonight. Funding for this program is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by... The South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Regional Health, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Post captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System and Fishback Financial Corporation. There's the, the bell. And which was healthier, the yogurt and the bagel? I'm going to start by measuring the size of it. You could also add grilled chicken to this recipe. Blow hard! Blow, blow, blow! Keep pushing! Pull red handle to open bag. Good evening. The first brain surgery likely happened after a heavy club came down upon some caveman's head. We know that pushed-in skulls were pulled out by first drilling a hole. But more importantly, the underlying blood clot was allowed to escape the entrapped space within the skull. Actually, we have evidence from France more than 7,000 years old of healed skulls that had recovered from such a procedure. We even have some of the equipment they used to drill and cut holes in skulls. In Greece, 2,400 years ago, Hippocrates described similar treatment for head trauma. In his words, when an indentation by a weapon makes takes place on a skull, whether a fracture is evident or not, it requires cutting a hole in the skull. There were brain surgeons that followed from ancient Rome and then from Arabia. In fact, there was a, apparently an Islamic brain surgery school that flourished 1,000 years ago. Of course, modern brain surgery developed in step with abdominal surgery, the development of sterile technique, the discovery of x-ray, and was greatly enhanced by the invention of the CT and the MRI scan of the head. We still drill holes in skulls to allow blood clots to escape, and that part hasn't changed much for the last 7,000 years. Today we have one of those skull drillers. Here to join us is brain surgeon Dr. Hank Klopper of Avera Medical Group Neurosurgery in Sioux Falls. Hank, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So, <clears throat> Hank Klopper, I thought of that name and I went, my goodness, that sounds like it's a German name. So, uh, you're from where originally? Born in South Africa and uh, immigrated with my family to Western South Dakota, actually, when I was about 12 years old. <coughs> Philip, South Dakota. So, you, so you, you grew up speaking what language? Um, well, both English and uh, Afrikaans were the official languages of South Africa at the time, and uh, those have expanded now, but uh, grew up speaking both. Okay. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> that question is, um, the uh, Afrikaans is how far from German? Uh, it's more closely related to Dutch. Um, it's, uh, I always tell people <coughs> that um, to people who speak Afrikaans, uh, Dutch sounds like old Shakespearean English, and to uh, people who speak uh, <coughs> Dutch, Afrikaans sounds like American inner city slang, probably. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we invite you to, uh, at home to call your questions regarding brain trauma. Our phone number is 1-888-376-6225. <clears throat> Again, that phone number is 1-888-376-6225. Oh. So, we, you came to South Dakota when you were 12, was raised in a small town in western South Dakota, Philip. That's right, I was a Philip Scotty. A Philip Scotty, so yeah. you played basketball at your six foot five height? Yeah, Is that I did, right? I did, yeah. That was a great experience. Yeah, so, and then you, where'd you go from there? 
Uh, from Philip, I went to Augustana College in Sioux Falls and uh, spent four years there and uh, went to medical school at USD uh, the first two years in Vermilion and then uh, the clinical part of the training in Sioux Falls and went down to Omaha for neurosurgery training after that. So what, what experience in Sioux Falls in med school that made you decide, whoa, I want to do a brain surgery? You know, the first... I, I was curious, I think, like most people about it, and the first time I saw one of these surgeries and then saw the patient actually wake up and uh, still be functional, just it, uh, it amazed me and uh, couldn't turn back from there. So, and being able to bring the skull back and actually dive in on the brain yeah. amazes me too. Yeah, I couldn't, uh, couldn't believe it. Now some people do recover. Still can't believe it. Some people don't recover. Right. It's a tough area. Absolutely. How much of your practice is brain surgery? How much is, I know you do spine surgery too. Right. Uh, about 60% of my practice is spine surgery for uh, the more common spine problems, uh, mostly related to arthritis and wear and tear changes in the spine. And uh, then the rest is uh, mostly brain surgery and a little bit of nerve surgery outside of the spine. Like what kind of nerve surgery? Carpal tunnel surgery. Oh yeah. Ulnar nerve releases. Those are the most common. Uh, less commonly repairing nerves that have been injured <clears throat> in some way. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, lacerations where you p reconnect the nerves? Correct. Now yeah. that's microscopic stuff, huh? Yeah. A lot of the stuff that we do actually is under the microscope. And, yeah. Uh, yeah it's, uh, so uh, the whole thing about brain surgery, I know, uh, evolved really from that whole bit about subdural hematomas. And it, it amazes me to think about the history of how that all happened. Yeah. We're still running into subdural hematomas. Absolutely. Let's talk about those. Uh, that most of the time is from blunt trauma to the brain. Right. Not just a caveman hitting a guy over the head with a club, but what? Yeah. what it used see? to be most commonly cavemen hitting each other in the head. Uh, now car accidents. Car accidents. Are probably the most common cause. <clears throat> Falls from uh, height at work or for whatever other reason. Uh, or being or still people getting hit in the head yeah. still happens still unfortunately yeah. they they um, so uh, that's a good question how much of a, a head trauma has to occur for a person to be affected by it we see subdural hematomas in people who have uh, something insignificant sometimes even so insignificant uh, that they don't remember and uh, especially elderly folks are more at risk for those types of subdural hematomas um, but then we also see subdural hematomas commonly in high energy trauma, as in a car accident where right. someone is thrown from a car or roll, you know, car rollover. Or they slam their head into the windshield. Yeah. yeah. So, the, uh, but, uh, so explain what a subdural hematoma is. Well, the dura part of the term subdural hematoma refers to the covering of the brain. Uh, we all have a thick, um, almost leathery type of covering of the brain, and subdural means that the uh, hematoma is beneath the dura, so between the covering of the brain and the brain itself, and hematoma means collection of blood. Right. So somebody has a trauma, maybe they don't even remember the trauma, like you said, it's an older person, they get a little bit of a bleed, the bleeding stops, yeah. and it may sit there for a while, and then over weeks to months even, mm -hmm. that can grow. Tell us about that. So uh, this is a fairly common problem that we see. And uh, so the, like you said, the old person hits their head and uh, then have a small collection of blood in the subdural space, small subdural hematoma. And then um, if they reach a certain size, they kind of take, a life of their, take on a life of their own and continue to grow by drawing in fluids um, by the body, trying to fix it and uh, forming an inflammatory membrane there. Uh, which then can continue to bleed little bits at a time and slowly with time the hematoma gets larger so until the, it causes symptoms of compressing the brain. Yeah. Yeah. I had a person who presented with uh, a mild head trauma weeks before. CAT scan had been done, minimal problem. Weeks goes on and then the family's noticing she's losing ground. She's losing more ground. She's kind of forgetting. She, now it's becoming an obvious major problem. This is a month and a half, maybe even after the trauma to her head. They had a CAT scan. Something's wrong. They called me. I said, we need to get another CAT scan. Yeah. Now, it's a CAT scan, not an MRI, because? Well, CAT scan uh, is better for a couple of reasons in the acute phase or early after an injury. Uh, it's much faster, but it gives us the information that we need. An MRI scan um, 
does give more detailed pictures than a CAT scan of the brain tissue itself, but doesn't really help us that much more in diagnosing a problem like a subdural hematoma. And in fact, because it takes so long and with a person with a problem with their brain, um, it's uh, actually a little bit dangerous to have them in the MRI scanner in that tunnel for a long time right. and for not a lot more benefit. Right. Or and, any benefit. Really. Right. And actually, and the CAT scan shows the blood fat, uh, almost even better. Be, be, bleeding yeah. is a more obvious CAT scan. Yeah, the CAT finding. scan is great for that. Yeah. yeah. So, so we have a, a bleed that occurs and it grows. It has a life of its own because it sucks in fluid and it bleeds again because it's growing. Yeah. So it's yeah. almost like a tumor. Yeah, it is. And uh, behaves very much like a tumor on a shortened, compressed time scale. <clears throat> and, and it's caught under this leather-like covering of the brain, and so it pushes into the brain and the brain loses ground. Yeah. And to treat it? There's a couple of things. Early on, when you have a subdural hematoma, the blood is clotted, just like anywhere else. If you cut your arm, the blood clots and right. uh, forms a thick clot. Um, so early on, in the first uh, 14 days or so, first couple of weeks after you get a subdural hematoma, it's thick, clotted blood. And for that reason, you have to take off a piece of the skull to get that out if you need to. Now, if you can get by for a couple of weeks, uh, it, turn, it liquefies at that point. And then uh, most of the time, it can be done through a hole in right. the skull, like the caveman did. Like the caveman. Right. I had a patient who came, who had major brain trauma and subsequently uh, hypoxic injury. So yeah. unfortunately, there's been some significant long-term permanent brain injury. We were hoping for a reversal, but because of what happened, she ended up with part of her skull removed. Mm -hmm. So in the nursing home, she really ended up with half a skull. I mean, the skin was replaced. You could see the brain tissue underneath the skin. And then after about three months, I think we had the skull that was in cryo preservatives. Right. The skin open and the, cr and, the, and the skull tape put back. I've never seen anything quite like that. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that we do sometimes uh, in cases of trauma because the problem with the brain is it's extremely sensitive to swelling. And after an injury um, of uh, this nature, if someone's in a car accident or whatever the case may be, the brain swells, but it's stuck inside this closed box. There's only so much space for everything that needs to be inside the skull. And so at times as a... Uh, life-saving measure will take off a big piece of the skull to allow for the brain to have more room to it's swell. Just amazing, amazing. We really do need your call, 1-888-376-6225. Make sure to give us a call. We'd love your questions. When there is an injury to the brain, one can suffer a variety of problems. Some may be temporary or can be improved with therapy. Some may last the rest of your life and sometimes it may be years before an impairment comes to the surface to change your life. I was one of those guys who, when you um, ask him to do something, he's probably going to do twice that. And I, I just, I, that's who I was. And then came the ugly day. We were out uh, in the middle of, I don't know, what county is that? Millette County and uh, in the middle of nowhere. I mean, the middle of nowhere. Your cell phone wouldn't even work. And uh, I had shot a, a turkey the day before, and we didn't get it. I shot it with a bow and arrow. And I thought, well, you know, I'm gonna take it, uh, another look for that turkey that I shot yesterday, because usually you know, when you hit them with a bow, you don't kill them outright. I walked down into one sort of a bottom and that's all I remember that was it that's where he shot me the blast hit me right in the face I mean right there and uh, it wasn't much bleeding because it was so hot going in that it cauterized everything um, one went through my eye here one went through my I over here, and I uh, bet there's there's still probably forty or so right in here, and went to general or um, PT McKen McKinnon, and I was there for three months, 
And when I left, I came home and everything was going to be fine. I actually had some, I could use my right hand and right leg and right side of my face and all that. And, you know, I was just, I, I was fixed. I was cured. It's six years since the surgery or since, since I went in the hospital. And um, at that point, at about four years, it started, I started not remembering things. And I started not using this right hand and my leg, my right leg really hurt me. Um, then it just, it just went from there to this. And uh, I think the biggest, probably the biggest thing that I had to learn to do was to ask for help. And I'll tell you what, that was the most difficult part of this whole thing. My memory is so short that I can, I can hear somebody say something really important, like a, a church sermon. And I walk out of church and I can't remember it. Not being able to do what you wanted to do and not being able to say what you wanted to say and not thinking that things were important like they were and all those things wrapped up into one and I didn't want to do it anymore. But I finally, um, and this happened two or three times in the last so, six, seven years, there are things which you can do even though you've had a brain problem that if you go and try them, you'll find out you can do them. Um, and that's important. Uh, getting on that jet ski was a... <laughs> <laughs> was a major task. <laughs> I mean, I almost tried <laughs> getting on the thing. <laughs> and, uh, but once I was on it, I was fine. Took my wife around the lake and dropped her off and did some daring things. <laughs> I don't know that getting on a jet ski is all that important in life. But for me, it was. Thank you for that wonderful interview, Fred. Uh, uh, what take-home message would you say from that interview? I think uh, the thing that Fred touched on um, that's important is after serious brain injury like his, there's uh, some permanent effects oftentimes. And uh, it really is adjusting to a new life, adjusting your life and, um, and uh, getting the help from those around you to uh, adjust to this brain injury. It's, uh, it's like starting fresh yeah. in a lot of ways. A lot of ways. I, th I tell you, this man is the most determined rehabilitator. Just works every day, very hard at it. This is my job, I've got to keep going. He's just a, yeah. uh, does and a great job. Those are the patients that do That do well. well. And very he well. has done yeah. extremely well. Yeah. We have a caller, uh, stem cell research uh, question. Do you think stem cell therapy will help a person with cerebral palsy in time? I think it's possible. Um, there's. Uh, Let's explain what cerebral palsy is. Cerebral palsy is a long-term <coughs> condition of the brain uh, related to an injury um, during gestation or in, in the uterus or around the time of birth usually um, that um, is manifested with um, some spasticity in the limbs and uh, uh, different degrees of dysfunction of the brain yeah. in general. Yeah. I, I've seen people with cerebral palsy are brilliant people. I've, had, I've seen people who've had significant injuries to the brain that, that affect mentation too. But yeah. also the major thing is they're spastic, right? Yeah. And there was a big question of this is a childbirth indu induced injury that happened during childbirth and now the data is that it, it, it is not Most related. Most of the time is not, yeah. 90% of the time, more, yeah. more than that. So are you thinking that we're going to have stem cell implants for cerebral palsy? I think it's possible. I don't think that there's anything really close. I think it's probably several years away. The problem with the stem cells, it's being used in, a, in research for a bunch of different brain problems. Yeah. But um, the, the problem is um, the complexity of the brain 
there's, there's so many different types of cells in the brain and they all interact with each other in uh, different ways and in subtle ways that are very important. And the programming of stem cells to take on the particular function that's been lost is, uh, is a very tough task, I think. So, <clears throat> Guy was describing this complexity of the brain uh, on a lecture that I was listening to. And he said, well, really four parts. There's this reptile part that has all of the basic things, you know, the sexual, the breathing, you know, these things. And then there's this uh, furry mammal part that has a little bit more advanced things that they need to do. And then there's this uh, more of a monkey part that takes on uh, extra aggressive things. And then there's this huge frontal uh, uh, human uh, part of the brain. Uh, how would you What's your response to that? Uh, I think that's uh, a very kind of uh, rough description of the brain. That uh, that's accurate. It's um, uh, we have uh, similar parts to the reptiles and the monkeys. Uh, the biggest way in which we're different is the size of the frontal lobes. So and the frontal the lobes, thinking... the big frontal part of the brain. Let's talk about that. What does that part of the brain do? Those are the thinking, reasoning parts of the brain that. Uh, really separate us from um, the rest other of animals. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so we were talking about a prefrontal lobotomy that was that people used to do for people who had psychiatric illness. They don't do it anymore. No. Uh, what, what happens when there's major injury to the, to the, the frontal lobes? The, in that operation, they would basically disconnect the frontal lobes from the rest of the brain. And um, those uh, people that had that surgery would be, um, they would have no motivation. They would basically sit in a chair in front of a window all day, and uh, that was the treatment for their psychiatric problems. Um, they would be more cooperative, of, and that yeah. was the thought, oh, well, they're, they're wild and crazy. I mean, they're just screaming and yeah. uncontrollable, and we had no medicine at that time. Right. And it was uh, commonly used, you know. And um, it, uh, it was a part of those times, but um, some serious ethical issues arise when you talk about that kind of thing. And uh, in fact, some well-known people have had it. The Kennedy family had uh, the uh, senator and uh, JFK had a sister who had a frontal lobotomy yeah. for those reasons. Yeah. Uh, the other story, however, is that in the movie or the play, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, um, they did shock therapy of the brain, which is not unethical. It's very effective. It's yeah. very good that they have given that a bad name and put it in synonym, you know, make, making people think it's the same thing as a frontal lobotomy. It is not, correct? Correct. It's a very effective treatment for some psychiatric problems that don't respond very well to other things that we have, like medications. And uh, the, I think I've seen the movie, as many people probably have, and it's dramatized somewhat in there. It's done under anesthesia, like a surgical procedure, and uh, can be very effective and very helpful for people. So we're, we're supporting the idea of shock therapy for the brain because for people who are severely depressed, it's a non-medicinal therapy that's very effective when Absolutely. needed, when appropriate. Yeah. Frontal lobotomy, forget it. Not right. do that, right? Not doing that. Um, what about uh, from Brookings? If someone has brain injury, is there an increased probability of dementia when they're older? Okay, so if someone goes along, has that head trauma, they, they recover. How about dementia as an elderly person? That's not uh, very clearly defined right now. What we do know from some recent information is that these uh, professional football players who are yeah. exposed to repeated relatively low-grade head trauma over the course of years do uh, at times go on to develop dementia like illnesses and um, the the details of that are not very well understood um, but I think that if you have a head injury the chances are still if you have one isolated head injury mild traumatic brain injury uh, chances are slim that you'll have dementia related to that. People have dementia for an unknown reason at this point right. unless there's little stroke we can define that and that can be treated by uh, all of the things that, uh, the blood thinners and the thin things that we treat vascular disease. But that's not your territory, is it? That's generally that's, somebody else's. Right. 
So, uh, but I love that question because it really speaks to the issue and the fears that we all have about head trauma. Absolutely. Here's a question. How often does hyponatremia occur with uh, head trauma? I That's think that, a yeah. great question. Uh, hyponatremia refers to a low level of sodium in the blood, which is one of the electrolytes that we need for our cells to function normally. Um, and it's very common in brain injury for different reasons. Uh, in part because the brain, uh, parts of the brain control the level of electrolytes and mm -hmm. sodium in our blood and um, control the function of our kidneys, to that which in turn controls the levels of sodium. And that's in fact one of the things in people with severe head injuries that we watch very closely and treat very aggressively because um, low sodium in the blood causes a lot of swelling of the brain which can make an underlying injury much worse and even catastrophic. Right, so we really monitor uh, sodium in all kinds of medical problems as well. So as a compliment to you, uh, uh, the internist takes care of people who have low sodium because they have uh, heart failure. And sometimes they are overhydrated and they've got all this fluid so their sodium goes down. Or sometimes they get low sodium when they're dehydrated uh, for uh, uh, too many diuretics or not enough water or not driven to drink enough. And then there's this syndrome of inappropriate ADH, which is uh, when they have a hormone that, that drives the sodium uh, in that way. Is that the kind that we have with brain injury for the most part? Um, oftentimes we do have the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, which um, is uh, where the brain is secreting a hormone that tells the kidneys to hang on to water and dilute the, the blood and dilutes out the sodium. Okay. Yeah. All right. We have a question. Uh, domestic violence hit in the head 35 years ago. Uh, uh, for eight months went away. Last four years, headache in the same place. Could it be uh, an aneurysm? So it had a knot, kind of a pain in a certain area, I'm thinking. So domestic violence, head trauma, now chronic headaches. Yeah. You know, it's uh, tough to make a diagnosis without a little bit more information. But what I can tell you is that from that type of trauma, to develop an aneurysm directly related to that would be very unusual. Uh, we sometimes do see aneurysms related to trauma, but that's more often from what we refer to as penetrating trauma or gunshot wounds to the head and that type of thing. Um, However, I think if you are having problems with persistent headaches, my recommendation would be, would be to start with your primary care doctor and um, who will um, help determine if uh, this should be looked into a little further. Yeah. Right, and you, you mentioned aneurysm of the brain. Uh, what is a brain aneurysm? I mean, people talk about an aortic aneurysm, which is a dilation of the aorta, the big vessel that comes off the heart and comes down. It can happen anywhere along the way, but mostly it's in the abdomen below uh, where it sends vessels to the kidneys and that fusiform, that dilated area can be fixed in a variety of different ways. That's not the brain aneurysm. Totally different story. What is a brain aneurysm? A brain aneurysm is a weak spot in one of the arteries in the brain itself, uh, one of the main arteries. And uh, they usually happen at points where the arteries are branching out and um, they can be caused by a number of reasons. But the one thing that people uh, can do to minimize their risk of getting an aneurysm, or if they do have an aneurysm, minimizing the risk of having a rupture is to not smoke and not use tobacco products. Um, but uh, the problem with the aneurysms is a lot of times they don't cause any symptoms. They're there for a long time and you don't know that they're there, um, but they can rupture and cause a very serious life-threatening stroke. Right. Yeah. So let's say that, uh, so is there any way to know or should you study that? Uh, what clue would I have? For example, if I had a family history for aneurysm, would I have any s special brain studies to look for them? There are some uh, conditions that, are, that run in families that are associated with aneurysms. If you have one of those conditions, um, then um, screening would be a good idea with a specialized type of CAT scan. Um, otherwise, if you have had uh, two uh, direct family, part of your immediate family, two members of your immediate family who have had aneurysms or ruptured aneurysms, you should be screened. So, uh, so this c conditions are like Marfan syndrome, I Marfan mean? syndrome, polycystic kidney disease is the most common one associated with it. So perhaps those people who have Marfan syndrome in the family or have Marfans, which are these tall people like you that, uh, but uh, 
different in, in other ways. Right. Because you don't have Marfans, do you? Not that I know of. Okay. No. So, uh, but uh, those are these long, lanky, extra long armed uh, basketball players who blow aneurysms in yeah. their brain. Yeah. So what do I do? I mean, you as a brain surgeon have special things that you can do. Or are, are the interventional radiologists doing these things? For aneurysms? Yeah. The traditional treatment, um, which was first successfully done actually in 1937 in Baltimore, um, is to open the skull, do an open brain surgery, and put a clip on the aneurysm so blood can't flow into it. Uh, that's a procedure that we still do uh, relatively commonly. In the 90s and... But now you were, you're going to be clipping off an artery so it doesn't get blood flow, you'd, you'd think there could be a stroke as a result of that. Right. You're not clipping off the artery itself, you're clipping the aneurysm that so is it's coming a off tuft the artery. Of a ball of little vessels. A little balloon that comes off the artery. So yeah. you clip the balloon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And then uh, in the um, 90s, a uh, new technique has come along starting in the 90s that's still being refined today called endovascular or coil embolization of uh, aneurysms where uh, the aneurysm is treated from inside the blood vessel, much like if you have a family member who's had a heart catheterization. Uh, it's done through the artery and the groin and the leg, and a catheter is um, snaked all the way up into the aneurysm, and little titanium coils are put into the aneurysm, so blood clots off and the aneurysm doesn't have any more blood so flow. So you push this little coil in this aneurysmal area, clots off, risk of aneurysm goes away, and it works? It works most of the time. It's not 100% effective. Um, it's, uh, it's a very uh, helpful treatment, especially for aneurysms that can't be treated with open surgery. Um, it has um, a little bit uh, lower risk, some people think, than uh, open aneurysm surgery, although it still has some very serious potential risks. Um, the main problem with it is that it's not as durable as we'd like to see right now. It's getting better all the time, but right. oftentimes the aneurysm needs to be treated again. Years okay. down the road. Years down the road. Yeah. Right. Imagine this. You start off on an errand that you've been on a thousand times before, then you wake up in a hospital room with a bandages on and an IV in your arm. This isn't an episode of the Twilight Zone. It is reality for some. This was on April 30th of this past year. And I was going to go to church at St. Thomas More on a Saturday night. And I um, knew it was very windy that day. But I told my husband I was leaving. And I always use the south parking lot at St. Thomas because that's the direction I come from. And I got out of my vehicle, locked the door, and started up to the church. I remember nothing after that and I guess from what they tell me the door attacked me and um, knocked me backwards onto the sidewalk but went across my face and my upper body and um, all I know is someone came along and either called 911 or called the ambulance and um, they took me to the Brookings Hospital, which called my husband and told him that I had been injured and they were going to airlift me to Sioux Falls. And when I woke up in the hospital and saw the name on the cup that said Sanford, I knew that's where I was. But that's about the first I remember. And then of my family being there, my husband was there all the time. and. Um, you know, I'd remember seeing him, but I wouldn't really remember what was going on or what we talked about or anything like that. In the beginning, the doctors painted kind of a sad picture, you know. They weren't sure I was going to come out of it or um, that I'd be able to come back home. I went to physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. Um, for an hour each in the morning and then an hour again in the afternoon. The doctor that took care of me told me that I had one of the most severe concussions he had worked with. And um, uh, they started talking about me being able to come home the last week or so that I was in the hospital. and. Um, 
So I did get to go home. I got out of the hospital at the end of May, and um, I got to come home then. I went to therapies here in Brookings, um, especially speech therapy and physical therapy, and then I had some of my own occupational therapy things that I needed to work on. And um, so it, you know, it just took a while, but I was able to graduate from all those therapies and um, move on to coming back home. He did tell us that it could be a, a real dealing. You know, I think he told my husband and girls that I could end up not making it. I could end up in the nursing home. And I think my doctor feels like you know, he'd give me little tests all the time, like he'd say, now, um, you know, he'd tell me a story about uh, something in the tree and looking out the window, and, and then he'd go back and, and ask me some of these things, and I always was able to respond to most of them. Thank you so much for, for allowing us to, to film you and a nice interview. Um, so, uh, I've got a question that says, describe a coiling. We just did that, but t tell us about what it looks like. It's a tiny titanium coil that uh, coils into a pre-specified pre shape and size inside the aneurysm. So you brain. push it out of, its, out of its container and it goes... Yep, and it's like a ball of yarn that goes inside the aneurysm. A ball of yarn. Microscopic. Or not quite microscopic, but small, a small ball of yarn. But it isn't, it doesn't uncoil until you get it to the right spot. Right. Yeah. Does it ever cause problems like clot that extends in the wrong spot? Yeah, one of the risks of that procedure is causing a stroke from blood clotting in the vessel where the aneurysm is coming off. And also, rarely, rupture of the aneurysm while you're trying to coil it. But We're, that's unusual. Let's talk about stroke. You know, the strokes are two kinds. One is a clot, one is a bleed. And of the clot type, there are two kinds. One is a clot that flips, and the other is one that forms. Yeah. Now, where is a neurosurgeon involved in those three groups of, of uh, stroke patients? Uh, we become involved in uh, both those types, actually. Um, one of the most common causes of the clot that breaks off and causes a stroke is blockage in the arteries in the neck. Uh, some neurosurgeons do the uh, carotid endarterectomy, or the where you scrape the clot out of the artery. Um, and then after patients have a stroke like this, we become involved sometimes when they have a huge amount of brain swelling that becomes life-threatening. And what do you do for brain swelling surgically? Um, that uh, is the same procedure where we take off a piece of the skull. And, and allow it to expand without uh, destroying right. itself. Right. And there's no danger there. I mean, the real danger would only be infection, but the danger is being caught in a tight skull, not, not able to expand, and then it destroys brain tissue. Right, right. What about putting in tubes that drain the pressure off the canals and the lakes of fluid that are within the brain? Yeah, sometimes with some of the bleeding type of strokes, um, you can have blockage of the drainage of the spinal fluid, which can cause also buildup of pressure. And uh, for that reason, we sometimes put tubes into the fluid spaces in the brain to relieve that pressure and drain fluid out of the brain. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we've got a patient who called in uh, 75, had an AVM, uh, and no surgery and is fine now. What, tell us, explain that. An AVM uh, is an arteriovenous malformation. It's an abnormal connection of an uh, artery and a vein in the, in the brain. Uh, you can get them in other parts of the body too, but... Uh, so it's a vein that comes together prematurely, too big, with the vein, and then there's this huge high flow kind of a buzzing thing. Yeah, and that, uh, that can cause uh, stroke from bleeding or from stealing the oxygenated blood from the surrounding brain. Um, and there's um, a variety of treatments for that problem. Some of it is surgery to take out the AVM and take okay. out that abnormal connection. Sometimes it's radiation, actually, which is a very effective treatment for that problem. Um, and sometimes also trying to block it off with glue through the catheters, like we talked about. Oh, really? The coiling. Yeah. It's a glue kind of a thing. Yeah. So but, you uh, just kind of come in there, you put the glue, and you try to stop it from 
and you add, let the arterial blood flow go to the arteries where it's supposed to, not back into the right. vein. Right, yeah, blocking off the abnormal connection. Yeah. Wow, I haven't heard of that. Will Alzheimer's medication help with memory loss that may be uh, due to a subdural hematoma 30 years ago? That's a tough question because um, you can have a subdural hematoma and then later develop Alzheimer's as a separate problem which is not related. Um, so that's, uh, that's tough to answer, but I would uh, visit with a neurologist and uh, with your primary care doctor about that and, um, and work it out. The answer is it's tough to know which is which and not yeah. much to do once dementia gets, starts, yeah. starts to come. It's a tough problem, yeah. Tough problem. Describe what they mean when a boxer is punch drunk. Um, it, uh, I think, refers mostly to a type of concussion where uh, a boxer has a concussion and then has some balance problems and um, some uh, thinking problems and fuzziness. Now that's a temporary deal. There's also the people who've had repeated trauma, repeated trauma, and back to what you had said earlier, yeah. they have sometimes dementia or um, Parkinson's disease. Yeah, yeah. And Muhammad Ali obviously is the perfect example. example. Yeah. Yep. Rapid City, what do you think about cell phones and brain problems, brain tumors? Uh, I think that uh, there have been several large studies where they've looked at this problem in huge numbers of people. And uh, the indication is that probably it does not cause uh, brain cancer. If it does, the risk is extremely low. Right. Now, there are some people out there who um, disagree with that. Uh, but uh, in large part, it seems like probably not. Yeah, I think that there's some people who are who say it's, it's got to be true. It's got to be true, and we we can we can blame the phones. But the truth is, the studies are not supporting this. I mean, they've looked at it scientifically. Nobody's benefiting one way or another, right. and it doesn't make a, a lot of difference. If it's any, it could be. It's a very subtle difference. Yeah, you know, you keep. I keep thinking of of. of uh, Bill Janklo and uh, his brain tumor, and uh, I know that the man had a phone to his ear continuously, and it scares me because I have a phone to my ear a lot. Yeah. Probably coincidence, not not related. Yeah, there you go. Uh, from here, a person has spinal stenosis, suffers a lot of pain. What what kind of doctor is it best to see? So I know that neurosurgeons do or uh, back surgery. Orthopedic surgeons do back surgery, spinal surgery. Um, you know, tell, talk to me about that. Yeah, you know, I think, uh, you know, these back problems are so common. And most of these patients um, will start with um, seeing their primary care doctor. And there are a number of treatment options before it comes to surgery. And in that process, um, physiatry doctors can be involved. Uh, pain anesthesia doctors who can do cortisone type injections in the back to help with that type of nerve pain from spinal stenosis, which is uh, effective a lot of times. Um, and when it does come to surgery, like you said, orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons both do spine surgery. And, um, and you'd say the neurosurgeons do a better job than the orthopedic surgeons? <laughs> no, I think there are uh, neurosurgeons that do a great job and orthopedic surgeons that do a great job. I think when it comes to surgery, that's, uh, th these are big decisions, especially when it comes to an elective surgery. And I think um, that the best advice as far as that goes is to find someone that you're comfortable with, someone that you trust, and uh, who, uh, who you believe is it going to help you? Help you, yeah. yeah. I think the take home I've, I've developed over the last years is that I, I know that I'm starting to think uh, back surgery when a person is losing nerve function. But when it's just back pain, the surgery is so, uh, so inadequate. And yeah. sometimes it only brings on more pain. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I tell my patients that with back surgery where we are really effective and really good is taking pressure off nerves pain radiating down the legs or weakness in the legs or a specific part of the leg from pressure on a nerve. Um, with those surgeries, we're very effective. But for back pain, pain in the back itself, um, surgery a lot of times makes things worse, uh, except in a few rare circumstances, like when there's instability in the spine, um, then actually it can, be, it can be helpful for that type of pain. We have a caller from Sioux Falls, nerve problem in hands. Can you talk about FSD? Do you know what FSD is? I don't. No. Uh, uh, nerve problems in hands. 
Um, unless they're talking about uh, reflex sympathetic dystrophy or RSD um, oh. is a problem that you can have sometimes. RSD, uh, yeah. Talk yeah. about RSD. That's what it is. It's a type of uh, problem with a nerve that causes chronic burning pain in an extremity, and it's usually related to some type of trauma, some type of injury to that nerve directly in the arm or the leg or wherever that might be. And uh, there are some, um, a lot of medical treatments for that, medications and things that can be very effective. Gabapentin. And, yeah, or uh, Lyrica, Lyrica is another one. And uh, rarely surgery to, uh, for example, sometimes um, it can be very effective to put in a spinal cord stimulator where you actually stimulate the surface of the spinal cord to essentially distract the spinal cord from the pain that's coming in from that abnormal nerve. That trapdoor theory that if you can distract the, if you can put a, um, some kind of irritant over here, then the, the, the nerve isn't getting the stimulation. Yeah, and, and that's the same concept as when you hit your thumb with a hammer. And the first thing you do is to rub it because uh, that stimulates different nerves than the pain nerves that are screaming that your thumb is really hurting yeah. and uh, distracts the spinal oh. cord from that pain. I hadn't heard that discussion. Rapid City discuss AVM and the treatment involved. We just did that. Had a head injury 10 years ago and he still has no sense of smell. Let's talk about smell and brain. Uh, is there a connection with head injury? Yeah, that's very common actually after a head injury. The, uh, Nerves that go from the nose, where the, the smell is sensed inside the nose, up to the brain, go through these tiny little holes in the base of the skull. And uh, they're, they're fragile, tiny, microscopic little nerves. And what happens oftentimes when you have an injury is that the brain, which essentially is floating in the spinal fluid, moves suddenly and essentially cuts those nerves off at the point in the skull where they come in. And it's a very common thing for people with a head injury to lose the sense of smell for that reason. Is it permanent? Um, sometimes it comes back after a little bit, but oftentimes it is permanent. So yeah. that, that cribiform plate, they say. Now, the cribiform exactly. plate is that uh, the little tiny holes in the skull. It's an interesting part when you're looking at a skull. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the first things you notice if you look inside a skull. There's all these tiny little tiny holes. Tiny little holes where the nerves go through and get clipped off when the brain that's floating is nicely described. Uh, here's a dis uh, fell and hit a head. Two months later, head is still hurting. What could be the cause? What do you recommend? Uh, there are a number of things that can cause headaches, including the subdural hematomas that we talked about earlier. Um, if uh, you have some uh, problems with weakness or numbness or tingling or problems thinking, anything associated with the headache, uh, that would be a more urgent sign to get it looked at with a CAT scan or one of these things. Um, Although with a concussion, which does not involve any bleeding in the brain or blood clot on the brain, it's very common to have this post-concussive syndrome, which is uh, the most common symptom of that is headache, which can persist for two or three months after a concussion. Um, but but uh, there's hope. I mean, most of those go away eventually. Most right? times, yeah. <clears throat> most times it gets better. Let's talk about concussion just a little bit. What is the exact definition of concussion? Uh, that's been a little bit variable, but. Uh, it basically is an injury to the brain from a blow to the head, as we commonly see, commonly see in sports, uh, that is typically not associated with an abnormality on a scan. So a person has this uh, blow to the head, and they have a little some dysfunction of the brain. They're not thinking quite right. Their balance is off. They lose consciousness for a couple of minutes. Um, they forget what happened right before the injury, very common. Um, and then that person goes in and has a scan. The scan is normal. And it's uh, more of a physiologic type of injury related to the blood flow and the availability of glucose to a specific part of the brain that um, is, is not uh, acting normally after the blow to the head, more so than it is uh, anatomic or structural injury to the brain. So now I understand recently uh, all of this post-concussive stuff that's coming out about sports that, okay, you had your concussion, rest yourself, you'll recover, vast majority of people have no problem. But if you go back into the game and you have a second concussion on top of that first one, uh, then there's uh, chances of long-term permanent brain yeah. injury. What do yeah, you mean? and you know, even rarely um, that can be a fatal problem from severe brain swelling called the second impact syndrome. It's, a, it's very rare, but happens sometimes. Um, so the, the main um, 
recommendations after a concussion are not to go back until your symptoms are gone. Completely. And, yeah, completely gone. And, you know, we have this uh, mentality of, you know, you have to be tough and, and tough it out. But it's, when it comes to the brain and concussion, the absolute best thing is to let the brain heal up appropriately before going back yeah. to sports. You're from Philip. You're a tougher guy than most guys out there. I mean, you played sports, so you understand the mentality of guys Absolutely. from South Dakota. Yeah, but as we learn more about this, we're realizing more and more how important it is to let the brain heal up. And um, that's becoming, with um, this uh, information that's coming from the NFL, there's been a lot of interest recently in yeah. concussion and concussion research. Yeah. Um, doctor's def definition of brain dead, what is that? Brain death refers to complete loss of function of the brain that is cannot get better because the brain uh, has essentially, you've essentially had a stroke of the entire brain. There's no function at all left of the brain. And the confusing part about that oftentimes is that the heart and lungs with support can continue to do their job without, without any the brain, brain working. at all right yeah and there's a question of how much uh, is brain dead is dead I mean you can they, they can do an EEG on a, a bowl of jello in an emergency room same, yeah. and it looks like uh, the EEG of a, a person who may be dysfunctional. Yeah. so it's a tough call you really have to look at function don't you right right uh, we had a question about statins have been mentioned with memory loss. All of these, you know, cholesterol-lowering statin drugs causing memory loss. Are you aware of any of that? I don't know much about that. That's uh, something probably better asked of one of my neurology colleagues. But uh, there is a lot of interest in statins outside of heart disease, which is where they've been mainly used for the past couple of decades, uh, including in aneurysms, actually, yeah. where... Um, they can help with a problem called vasospasm, which is a severe cause of problems after an aneurysm rupture. We hope that uh, drugs are effective, but sometimes uh, they, they can have side effects. Absolutely. And so you certainly don't want to consider them when they're side effects. It's a tough issue, yeah. individual patient. Yeah. So how, does, how important is nutrition in a brain, um, kid growing up without enough nutrition? The body is uh, very good at uh, protecting the brain. And, uh, but uh, for a kid to develop normally and to live to their best potential, nutrition is essential. Okay, and absolutely essential. Very important. One last question. Read recently that why find schools causing wave frequency? Can it cause kids to feel sick, parents to be worried? Wi Fi frequencies? No. Not that I know of. No. All right. And one, oh, I've got another one. Comment on memory loss. Okay, that one's been done. Comment on using, okay, radio frequency, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar pain. Radio frequencies treatment. Uh, that's a treatment uh, that we use sometimes for the back pain, like we talked about, where surgery is not likely to be helpful. And uh, it's for a specific type of back pain that arises from uh, a couple of the joints in the spine called the facet joints. We have two of these joints at each level. And uh, that's where sometimes it can be helpful. Very successful. Great. And the right patient. And the right patient. Yeah. <clears throat> Just after her 19th birthday, my sister was killed in an auto accident resulting from head trauma. No one wore seat belts in those days. Just after her 19th birthday, my sister was killed in an auto accident resulting from head trauma. No one wore seat belts in those days. Since then, society and the auto industry realized how many people suffered after being thrown headfirst into a windshield and consequently developed safety belts and airbags for every car. We know that they reduce the number of serious traffic injuries by 50 percent and fatalities by 60 to 70 percent. Of course, that's not 100%, and you always hear of the exceptions, but there is no question safety belts greatly improve the odds. The problem has been with getting people to buckle up. Hearing all the statistics, why would people not wear their safety belt? Well, perhaps it's because belts are thought to be an imposition, a bother, a restriction of freedom. It is interesting to note that Wyoming and South Dakota are the states that have the lowest use of safety belts in the country in the 70% range.
The top states are all in the 98% range, and the experts say this is because of more restrictive laws in those states where vehicles can be pulled over solely uh, for riders not wearing safety belts. This is called a primary seat belt law. In South Dakota, officers can only ticket adults for no seat belt when there is another broken law. Look at this in a different light. <clears throat> in medical ethics, it comes down to balancing three virtues. Do good and not harm, use honest science, and respect choice. Okay, it can be more complicated than that, but, but the basics of balancing those three truly help me as difficult cases walk into my office or roll into the emergency room. It demands a balance with not one of these golden virtues taking precedence. Of course, a more restrictive safety belt law in South Dakota would diminish freedom of choice. And I imagine that is why our legislators have not made the law. But as in medical ethics, they need to balance the virtues, balance the gains with the losses. My experience working in the emergency room brings me to think of all the head trauma that would be prevented by a primary safety belt law in this state. Indeed, a seat belt would have saved my sister's life. Hank, it's been a pleasure having you here. Do you have a, a take home message that you would like to give us? I think uh, you make a great point, even though we've come a long way over the last hundred years in treating brain injuries, uh, it's still a severe problem and uh, the, most, the best, most effective treatment we have is preventing the injury from happening in the first place. All right. And do we have that last essay, that's the, that last video, and how much time do we have? So, well, I, you know, a guy from Philip, it's a pleasure to have a man from Philip out here with us, and good luck on this neurosurgical career that you're, you're starting out. I know that you've got great experience under you already, and we, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much. Thank Appreciate you so it, much. Rick. Hey. Thanks. And that closes the book for our show on brain trauma. Thomas Edison once said, the chief function of the body is to carry the brain around. I sincerely thank my studio guest, brain surgeon Dr. Hank Klopper of Avera Medical Group Neurosurgery in Sioux Falls for visiting with us about this very important topic. And thank you, our viewers, for watching and calling. Our questions from you and their input make all the difference. Until next time, Stay healthy out there, people. Is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, Regional Health the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Well, you're right.